Hobart, Tasmania. And there's a sense of optimism in the air. The prospect of creating a new direction and a growing realization that Tasmania is a very special place indeed. The vision of a clean, green and beautiful state is heavily promoted worldwide. But there is another vision for the future of Tasmania. The 2020 vision, formulated by government and the timber industry. It is an operation throughout Australia and plans to convert vast areas of native forest and rural land into monoculture timber plantations to supply the wood chip industry. The 2020 vision has been planned in great detail. The strategy for the 2020 vision aims to remove legislative, technical, commercial and cultural impediments to plantation establishment. The widespread implementation of these aims and highly controversial forestry practices such as clear felling, regeneration burning, 1080 poisoning of native wildlife, aerial spraying of herbicides and pesticides, water catchment logging and the continued logging of Tasmania's world-renowned old-growth forests and rainforests has condemned all Tasmanians to a bitter struggle to shape the future of their unique island state. The image of Tasmania is quite clear. It's about being wild and different and free and clean. Already we're seeing tourism in Tasmania growing at a phenomenal rate. It's already passed forestry, I believe, in terms of its contribution to the economy, and it's going to continue to grow. And people are coming here to have a, a slice of that dream that is Tasmania. They come here to experience the environment, to experience the people, to experience the land, and just take a little bit of that home with them in their souls. And it's a priceless thing we have. The economic challenge for us is to go from being a feudal economy where Tasmanians grow spuds for absentee landlords or chop down trees for um, people who own companies that live a long way away to a top end economy. And that is the dream of the Tasmanian people that came out through Tasmania together. They understand that what we have here is something that is incredibly valuable, that at the moment is not being valued correctly. And that's our challenge, to actually move to the top end. All the ministers in parliament, all the environment minister, the tourism minister, have they forgotten that they are public servants? Have they forgotten that they are there because the people put them there? Have they forgotten to look after our state is the reason that they're there, getting well-paid jobs, but they're not putting it back into our state. They're not giving the people a chance to say, this is what we want. And if we stand up and say, we don't want all this to be destroyed, they're not listening. But it's the people that put them there in the first place to do the job. And the job isn't being done. It's us. It's, it's the people that live here, want here to stay. They don't want poisons in their water. They don't want all the animals to be dead. They don't want to look at fires burning from napalm burning. That's not what they want. They come here because of what is natural. So politicians, I think you've got to look at why you're in Parliament. I think you've got to look at the whole process of what's going on in Tasmania at the moment and it's not good. And there's a great dream in Tasmania about a clean, green future. And it's been a criticism that it's a dream, a green dream. But the truth is, it's a reality. When we look at what that might be, 
that's not just about people in little cottage industries, but it's about new, smart, service-based economy. It's also a, it's a Tasmania with an environment that's actually nurtured and cared for, um, for its aesthetic value, sure, but also for its economic value, because it actually underpins the Tasmanian brand. If we trash the forest, then we trash the brand. And that brand is a multi-billion dollar asset that we need to care for. I've been 50 years in the industry and I was well and truly involved before wood chipping. But since the wood chipping, I've had a fair bit of experience, 30 odd years of it. And I'd say for the first 20 years, perhaps, I can't really say I had a great lot of objection. But it's only over the past probably seven or eight, ten years that the industry has been totally destroyed simply through um, my pet bugbearers clear felling in high value regrowth country and by that I mean is stuff that's uh, called half grown being destroyed to be replaced by plantation. That's about it. I, I can't put a number on it, but there was, when I think back over, I can remember different stages, there was uh, six or seven little uh, bush sawmills with probably from five to 20 employed at each of them. When I was young, I suppose there was probably 100 people that lived in this district and employed in the district. And just off hand at present, I can only think of two. So that probably would be the biggest difference that I can think of. It's very difficult to find words that can adequately describe the horrendous vandalism that's occurred on this coop. How any civilised country on the planet today can allow this sort of stuff to be going on and shield it with the force of the law, locked boom gates, and a phony code of practice that's supposed to protect it is beyond comprehension. This disaster has been carried on under the auspices of the Forest Practices Code of Tasmania. Well, I'd like to challenge forestry to come out here and show how this does fit in with any card of practice because what I see here is the end of the earth. In a few short weeks, they have undone what nature has done over tens of thousands of years. This is the water supply. This is the place where nature stores, filters and lets down water over the summer when we need it as human beings. This has been trashed and destroyed by a one-off opportunistic harvest by the wood chip industry and what we have here is an absolute national and international disgrace and nothing short of a royal commission will unravel the uh, thuggery, the dishonesty and the destruction of the environment that the wood chip industry in Tasmania is today. So this is April, this is the April 1st, it's, uh, it's just after midnight but it's no joke. This is normally our most beautiful time of the year. Clear blue skies, still days, it's also the, uh, the burn season for forestry. Um, regeneration burns or waste burns such as we see happening behind me. Uh, what we're told is a, 
a normal world's best practice step in the, uh, in the clear felling and converting of old growth forest into plantation. This was once upon a time an old growth forest. It has been clear felled, pushed into these windrows or parallel rows of trees and, uh, and now being burnt so that um, exotic species, plantation uh, species of uh, eucalypts can be planted in the place of the old growth forest. I'm standing here next to a pile of myrtle timber that we've milled. There's 57 tonnes of it here. We've salvaged this from an old growth coop that was clear felled and then burned. And we got this timber from one little corner of the coop. Uh, we did a study in the coop as well and we worked out that uh, 600 tonnes of specialty timbers per hectare were left remaining in that coop following logging. Over the whole coop, which was over 100 hectares, we calculated over 60,000 tonnes of specialty timbers, that's myrtle, celery top pine and sassafras, left to be burned. Now, not only is this a waste in the short term, but the quality of this timber will be sought after by future generations of timber workers and we just simply will not be able to get the wood. So the fact that we're squandering this in the short term is... Uh, an embarrassment uh, and it's simply not on for timber workers that appreciate really good quality timber because this stuff will not be available in the future and we have no right to be cutting it if we can't find a good use for it. This is celery top pine uh, salvaged after the clear felling of an old growth forest. This timber is about 400 years old, uh, one of the world's finest boat building timbers and timbers of this quality and age will never grow back under f current forest management practices. We're here at uh, Weld Hill in the northeast of Tasmania. This area here was a degraded rainforest, so called degraded because logging had taken place within the last 100 years. The understory that is remaining here, which hasn't been carted away, consists of typical rainforest species such as musk, myrtle, some blackwood, and uh, sassafras, and uh, also these tree ferns. A tree fern grows about a centimetre to two and a half centimetre per year. So one can imagine if you've got a tree fern of over three metres, it's taking quite a while to grow. This whole area is going to be regenerated for eucalypt. So it's no longer then a forest, but it's actually just a makeup of trees of a desired species. One could also call it a monoculture. The whole range of diversity is being degraded here. This has nothing to do with sustainable management. I can tell you what it's about is a land grab. It's really a grab for this sort of soil, which is high quality soil. It just falls through the fingers. It's like potting mix. It's quite an old soil, but it is fertile and the root can actually penetrate through this soil so well. And aided by the good rainfall up here, which would be well over a thousand millimetre per year, um, it just uh, is ideally suitable for growing almost anything. And uh, what's actually happening is it's mainly degraded to grow pulpwood. Because uh, to grow high quality saw logs, it takes far more than just an open seed bed and good rainfall. It's, uh, that's a science in itself and unfortunately I haven't seen really good silviculturalists when it comes to growing good quality timber. At the moment the harvesting that takes place takes advantage of what was given by nature. It wasn't managed for timber quality and to claim that because we have got a timber industry that has taken away, i.e. harvested, the forest for the last 200 years. Therefore we know how to grow quality timber. That's just an outright 
supply. My big concern is that uh, is the water that's actually being used that isn't being credited, uh, certainly not available for anybody else. Uh, and unless we manage that water resource properly, uh, this island is, is looking into a catastrophe. For a given hectare of ground, um, a, a, a regrowing forest, let's call it that in general terms, because not all of these things are plantations, some are regenerations, uh, can use up to about 50% of the available water. Now that happens at the critical time in their growth cycle, uh, but it takes decades to come back to background levels. So you're looking at a water loss, substantial water loss, peaking at about half the total available water for a very long time. Uh, half this island uh, has rainfall levels typical of those uh, immediately uh, west of the Great Dividing Range. Uh, it's never been an abundant water environment. Western Tasmania might be very soggy and marshy, but Tasmania as a whole isn't. You just have to look where the power schemes are. Um, unfortunately, most of us live in that dry zone. Uh, we cannot afford to tamper with the headwaters of the rivers that feed into that zone. We just cannot afford to do it. Uh, even if we stop today, the prognosis isn't good because we've changed so much land so quickly. Um, and the water response is going to take years to catch up. So even if you switch it off, there are things that you cannot change quickly. Um, this is a very nasty situation. It's one where it's, uh, what's needed is a total balancing act. Future activity has got to be very delicately balanced to try and hold the water budget together. We simply cannot afford uh, to burn the water in this way, and which is what we're doing. We're just simply wasting it, uh, and we're indeed damaging everybody else along with it. Every time, every, everywhere we're here, you know, you need more water to grow things. Many, many towns are short of water. Uh, this issue is going to come home to roost. But unfortunately, when everybody realises that they do have to do something, the water is simply going to have been committed. Now, Forestry Tasmania has never owned a hydrologist. They have never wanted to listen to anybody who has known something about it. Um, they have not researched it. Their Forest Practices Code and Act does not indeed require them to, other than simply assure you that your water is safe uh, and that there'll be, it will be supplied. They're not in a position to guarantee it, and they haven't guaranteed it. Well, I would say that they haven't exercised any duty of care on this at all. Uh, the kind of argument that I have been running is based on considerable amount of research. Uh, I've been very cautious about how I've used it. Um, there aren't any questions about whether plantations use more water than background environment. There is no doubt about that. You might quibble about exactly how much and how many cups are involved. But the point is that if you're going to have a major land use change, you are going to have major water changes go with it. It's too late now. It is already too late the, the, in some areas. The vision I have, which I find quite appalling, uh, is that I know that there are some catchments which are so now overcommitted. Uh, and if they're overcommitted today, they're going to be even more overcommitted in 10 years' time. Because if the trees have only been planted in the last five years, they're going to be at maximum demand in about 10 years. And that's going to mean uh, probably a reduction of another 20 or 25% of summer flows in those rivers. And now, if they're already on the wire, they are dry. And anybody depending on them is out of business. Uh, you can't just, for example, cut down the trees and allow new ones to grow because all you get then is a repetition of the same problem we've got now. You actually have to slowly unjuggle it. Take, it's like a jigsaw puzzle that you have to, uh, to slowly rotate out the growth that you've put in to allow a natural forest to re restore. Uh, my estimate to do this over the hundreds of thousands of hectares that are involved is hundreds of years, probably 500 years, to get back what we would call a mixed native forest.
We're on the boundaries of the Cam River in northwest Tasmania, and what we're seeing behind us here is a massive log jam. Now, the forest industry will try and tell us that this is just uh, a cyclical normal event, but within that log jam, we'll see that there are lots of cut ends that have come down off the clear felled coops on the edge of the Cam Valley. The valley itself is extremely steep and uh, erosion prone and uh, as a member of the Cam River Action Group some years ago we were predicting uh, dramas like this with our water supply uh, to both local councils that border either side of the river here, the Burnie City Council and the Waratah Wynyard Council and the, the Water Treatment Authority and also to the then newly elected Labor government. Uh, we warned all of these sets of people that if we uh, go ahead through greed and uh, log these really steep water catchment areas, we're going to end up paying the penalty. And here it is. Here's the start of it. Now this, this log jam here, if it, if it clears itself with another big flood coming through here, it almost certainly will pose a very real risk to taking out the main bridge on, on the Bass Highway down at the coast. If it backs up uh, another 50 metres, it's going to destroy the uh, pump house to the local community's water supply system. And now here we have a situation where for quick bucks in someone's pocket, we're going to have undoubtedly at the end of the day the ratepayers footing the bill to clean out our water systems and uh, you know just is a constant amazement to me that in a supposedly sophisticated country we continue to carry on third world practices and put our waterways at risk like this. This is a giant Tasmanian freshwater lobster. Uh, this bloke's about oh, 20 years old and half size or half weight. He's only about two and a bit kilo, they get up to six kilo, so he's not even half weight, but he's about half the size of the biggest ones. He's a male, he's got the, the bigger claws, so a lot more meaty. I guess the claws of females are a bit uh, skinnier, smaller tail for a male, but these blokes are actually the largest freshwater crustacean or invert invertebrate on the planet. So He's pretty unique and only found in rivers in northern Tassie. And at the moment the river systems aren't in the best condition, probably less than 50%. Now, the story with these blokes is that um, they are listed now as uh, vulnerable on the threatened species list, and that's mainly due to overfishing and habitat destruction. Now, the fishing's been stopped, mainly because of the um, decline in population, but the habitat destruction still seems to be ongoing. Now, the one thing that people do need to remember about these animals is that there are no major areas set aside as far as high protection for them at the moment. Their protection is given as far as the Forest Practices Code goes, but we need more than that. You do need to have some areas specifically put aside for these animals so in the long term they've got a sustainable future. As far as, you know, our great-grandchildren can go and see a full catchment that's absolutely loaded with them. That's not to say a lot of other catchments shouldn't be either, but we do need that the utmost highest priority protection on a certain few selected areas just to make sure that we do have near pristine areas looked after. So I live up in the head of the North Esk. Uh, we're just down here at the moment having a look at erosion. We've got trees washed out from fast flowing water. Banks gone on the sides. Fence is falling in. It's caused through logging in the heads of the, the catchment area, which is creating a faster flow of water down lower. It's creating a, a hell of a lot of siltation. It's unbelievable.
Yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. Can yeah. Can yeah. Can that this is going to end up at the bottom. Of then, course, yes. yes. No, in the time yeah. river, that's, that's exactly that's right. That's exactly yes. where it does end up. No. And then we all pay for it to get drenched. <laughs> we just over here. There's, mm, look at this. Now, here we have uh, dead animals. Mm, this is a, a deer laying beside the, the uh, a little river, a little creek. The forward river actually is beside. And they were poisoned. Oh, yeah. Oh, I know but there's not one, there's hundreds. Hundreds. We went there 10 days after the poison was laid, and there was uh, numerous amounts of dead bodies still lying in their water, and literally they're only, you know, hundreds of metres down taking water out of the creek. Oh. So they're actually rotting away there? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, hundreds of them. One coop. One particular area. area. One, one period. Which is quite... Now, when I was doing it, they said in the handbook we were given, they said 10 metres from a water source, fine. About 20 metres from a road, fine. The problem was, the game came from everywhere and they picked up all that bait and there was very little bait left and it slaughtered them on that block by the hundreds. I've never seen anything like it in my life. It was just a sea of dead animals. You name it, they were dead. And, my God, and there was just, there was just dead animals everywhere. And I'll never forget there was a nice little waterfall coming over into a bit of a water hole. And that was just floating with dead wallaby. And this was 500 yards from my nearest bait line. I didn't even put any bait down there, at least 500 yards. And I went down in there because you could see. I just started picking one wallaby up and another one, and here's another dead possum over here. Oh, here's a couple of dead wombat here. And started picking them up. And then I got to where this little waterfall was, which was about as high as this room and as wide as this room. I can still take it in and show you. And it was just a sea of dead wallaby. Even my mate who came along, even he said, my God. And, I, and he was flat out all day, he just following me around. And I'd pick him up, put him on the motorbike, he'd take him, put him in a hole, come back again, pick him up. And as fast as he could come back, we were picking up dead game. And there was a creek, flowing creek, and it was just full of dead animals. Just every, all the way down the creek. They were even hooked up in the fence. There was a fence coming down through the middle of the block. And they were even tangled up in that. Now it was just appalling. So that's what I used to do. I can't think of one block where I didn't kill a wombat. Not one. The average, I always knew I was going to find dead wombats and dead ringtail possums. And you could see by the prints on the ground where um, tiger cats and particularly devils had been gnawing on the animal like they'd been poisoned. It only makes sense because we'd go around, walk around laying bait down and you could see some of the kangaroo and the wallaby, they'd be sitting there like this looking at you. And mm, you knew you were going to get them yeah, it was only, you know, it's like feeding carrots to kids or lollies to kids at a kindergarten. They're there, you're here, and you're putting bait on the ground, and they come out. And in a lot of cases, they'd be sitting because they get to hear the motorbike or see you coming. And I turned around, and I used to turn around and look back down the block, and you could see the wallaby out in the evening sitting there eating the poison carrot. So you knew full well you were going to get them. Then there was the birds. Eagles. Now I never found a dead eagle, but what used to worry me was this. Found a couple of dead orcs, but what used to worry me was this. Those beautiful wedge-tailed eagles. Now I've got a lot of time for eagles. They're a smart animal, and they used to follow you around when you were laying the just this carrot down. And then come the baiting. And what amazed me, what I found in a number of cases, on at least four blocks in particular, there was eagles on four blocks. The day after poisoning and the follow-up day after that and clearance, I never ever saw those eagles again. We used to find dead birds, but once again, don't worry about it, just bury them, move on to the next block.
It's appalling. It's just appalling. And there's no way anybody can tell me it doesn't kill them, because it does. I've seen them. I've had to pick them up and bury them. And it's not right. It's not right. So what I'm telling you is the truth. And if you want to either believe me or not, I'm telling you, I have been there, seen there, and done it. And it's got to be stopped, this 1018 business, as far as I'm concerned. It's just not right. It's not right. It's wrong. It didn't quite sink in the implications of what that meant. And it was really only until the following year when we woke up to the sound of a bulldozer clear felling native um, rainforest only 60 feet away from our house. That's when the shock hit. Um, a leading um, a figure in the company approached us uh, almost immediately and said they would be aerial spraying 100 metres away from us. And uh, I just couldn't believe that it would be lawful to spray that close, at say 30 or 50 feet height, to a, a residential house, as it was clear it was going to get into our tank. On the website, we have an archive of uh, files that relate to stories of contamination all over, all over the entire state. How can we comprehend the mentality of people in government who have knowingly allowed this to happen? We're talking about destroying life and we in the Western world in particular have lost track of the fact that that is our life and we're part of that and if we destroy that we will destroy ourselves. Out of those forests come the air that we breathe, the water that we drink and our very being and we've lost that and we're losing that. And it, that's why it is so important that we preserve and protect those areas because they're shrinking at an alarming rate. Here in the Florentine Valley, we're less than 200 metres away from El Grande, uh, Australia's biggest tree that was burnt in a regeneration burn by Forestry Tasmania less than a year ago. As you can see, clear felling is underway again. It's another example of the onslaught onto the, the tall wet eucalypt forests that are adjacent to the World Heritage Area. Any sensible forestry policy you would expect to retain the forest as a buffer. El Grande is clearly dead. It's shedding its skin like a like a dead animal, a decomposing animal, yet there's still no respect or still no thought for its future in terms of leaving it standing. It's going to leave El Grande exposed to the severe westerly winds that will blow in over winter. It's yet another example of the potential, the tourism potential here, tourism potential that's being lost through careless forest practices to the central highlands and the Florentine Valley. This is the blue tear giant. It's got a girth of 19.4 metres and it's the third biggest tree on record in Tasmania. Thanks everyone for 
were coming. When we started camping down the Boom Gate eight weeks ago, we couldn't have possibly imagined what was going to happen. And you know what what happened down there was that, that the community just kind of moved in and looked after us. This tree is 16.8 metres round the girth, but we're not sure if that's big enough to save it or not. Mutual Valley, the next valley over, was just like this, and we walked through before any, any of the trees had been chopped down, and there were groves of these gigantic trees, and there's really, there's none of them left, really. The whole valley floor now is plantation, and there's one small patch left on the top of the ridge, which is the best that the community could hang on to, and that's it. Can you imagine hoeing your chainsaw into something like this? You know, dozing up these magnificent ferns. It's just really, really hard to imagine that anyone could actually physically do it, or mentally do it, I guess, would be more the point. I've brought hundreds of people to this area we're in now, and, you know, without fail, they, firstly, they can't believe that it would even be considered to be clear-filled. And, you know, they all say they couldn't bear to think of that happening. But they don't really know what to do or how to stop it. One thing that amazed me about uh, Tasmania is uh, the degree to which forestry influence is found in every sort of institution that has anything to do with the environment, uh, anything to do with planning. And you find it at the local government level and the state government level. And uh, they seem to be all powerful. I was very interested when back in 2000, I got a call from a friend on the northwest coast uh, relating of a, a very strange incident uh, in which he had uh, been uh, in a telephone conversation with somebody from the land services department in Hobart who had uh, confided that he was very disturbed about uh, something he'd been instructed to do. Uh, he had uh, been receiving a large number of, of titles, land titles, being transferred as freehold to Forestry Tasmania. And uh, he'd been told to keep it off the valuation roll. Now, nobody could see why uh, freehold was being given to Forestry Tasmania because uh, it is subject to council rates and stamp duty and so forth, which Crown land isn't. So we en endeavored to find out more through a, a sympathetic senator and who uh, made inquiries and uh, discovered, you know, from the relevant minister, David Llewellyn, that uh, it in fact uh, involved 97,000 hectares being transferred as freehold to Forestry Tasmania. We were concerned because people living down here are well aware that uh, it is an enormous uh, uh, conundrum that Forestry Tasmania, which is a government business enterprise, uh, appears to operate as pretty much a subsidized you know, charity for the private logging sector. It makes very little money itself, a nominal amount, and uh, provides all kinds of services for the private sector who make, well, the private sector is largely one company who is making stupendous profits. When I moved down here, some people said, could you have a look at the finances of the logging industry in Tasmania, and particularly forestry Tasmania? 
And I knew that uh, clear felling rates had increased a lot over the last five years. In fact, they've doubled. And I was interested to see how much profits had gone up over those five years. In most industries, if you double your volumes, as Forestry Tasmania has doubled its clearing rates, you would expect to really increase your profitability. So I was very surprised when I looked at basic accounting ratios for Forestry Tasmania and saw that while volumes of clear felling have doubled over the last five years, dividends to the people had actually halved. And this is very um, unusual financially because it means that profitability has, um, has been absolutely hammered. Now, when I started to look at the reason why that was, there were two main things going on. Firstly, there's been a really big shift from production of uh, high quality timber products to production of pulpwood. So for example, over the last five years, volumes of production of timber, category one and three, which is the good stuff, has gone up 20%, but volumes of wood chips has gone up 100%. So volumes of wood chips have doubled, clearing of native forest has doubled, but profitability has halved. And this is the profits to the state, the profits back to the people. So I thought that's, um, that's crazy, you know, where does the, the money go? And then I looked at the relationship between Forestry Tasmania and Guns Limited, which is by far and away its major customer. And I saw that Guns profitability over the same time that Forestry Tasmania's profitability had halved, had skyrocketed. And basically what was happening was that wood was being sold cheap from public land to guns and its shareholders were making a killing out of the relationship with Forestry Tasmania. So guns had basically become a monopoly in Tasmania over the last five years by buying up its competitors and it had a very profitable relationship with the state. Now unfortunately what's good for guns is not necessarily good for the state financially because most of guns profits go out of the state uh, what we receive is the dividend from Forestry Tasmania and it's that dividend from Forestry Tasmania that's halved. Sometimes with my, with my financial hat on I thought well sometimes governments do this stuff for the jobs so in other words they'll say we're prepared to accept a low financial return because we're creating value in the state through jobs. But when I looked at the ABS job stats in forestry for the last 10 years those had actually halved, so they'd moved from about 8,000 to 4,000 in the measures that the ABS tracks. So we had this bizarre triple combination of um, a halving of returns to the people, financial returns, a halving of jobs, and a doubling of clear felling rates. So the f equation only makes sense if you realise that the uh, the, the high super profits are going out to guns. It's, um, it's a joke of a business. It's a terrible return for the asset that they have under their stewardship. Uh, anyone who, who has studied forestry thinks that you can make much higher returns out of forests through smarter use. There's a great sadness uh, when people talk about the Tasmanian economic picture and you talk to them closely because they know that even though they're told and they, they can see and they understand that they're sitting on great wealth and that many of the industries in mining and forestry in Tasmania have generated billions and billions of dollars of revenue and profit, that money does not stick in the local community. Our challenge is to turn Tasmania into something more than just a place that you come to look at, but a vibrant, confident and respected community with a strong, vibrant, diversified economy. And that is the dream of the Tasmanian people that came out through Tasmania together. They understand that what we have here is something that is incredibly valuable, that at the moment is not being valued correctly.